Greetings and welcome to National Invasive Species Awareness Week. My name is Elizabeth Brown and I am the Director of Government Relations and Professional Development at the North American Invasive Species Management Association or NASMA. I am so excited for this amazing week of awareness and education and outreach and advocacy. Thank you for being here today with us and a huge thanks to USGS for helping us kick off this week with a really awesome uh, webinar this morning, jam-packed with some pretty fantastic speakers. So thanks to all of our presenters for being here and to all of our viewers for joining us today. Before we begin, allow me just a few quick minutes to share a little bit about NASMA with you for those that don't know us well. Our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management across North America. We are the stewards of international standards, such as the mapping data standards and the weed-free product standards for forage, gravel, and mulch. Education and advocacy is a huge part of what we do here, and you are joining us in that here at National Invasive Species Awareness Week 2022. Uh, public outreach and awareness is also a cornerstone of our mission, and Play Clean Go is our public-facing awareness campaign. Learn more at playcleango.org and get involved with Play Clean Go Awareness Week happening the first week of June. Uh, professional development uh, is something that we focus a lot on here at NASMA. We have monthly webinars, uh, trainings. Our webinars are the third Wednesday of every month. We also have special events like the EDMAP Summit happening soon. So check out the events page at nasma.org for all of our events and get involved. Uh, our annual conference, save the date, November 7th through 10th, 2022 in Fort Myers, Florida. We hope to see you there. The call for abstracts is out, so please check that out and submit an abstract if there's something that you would like to present on. And just to show you the lineup this week for NISA 2022, you are at the first event of the week. We've got events happening every day. And if you go to nisa.org and look at the events map, there are over 70 events entered all across the continent, webinars as well as local events, weed pulls, you name it. So check it out, see all the different opportunities available um, and get involved where it makes sense for you to do so. Um, we also have new policy pages up with take action options. So our legislative committee and subcommittees have worked very hard over the last year, creating new position papers, new policy statements, and opportunities for you to take action. Visit nisa.org to learn more about that. And we have a free resource toolkit, uh, lots of social media advocacy happening. Uh, so again, just thanks for being here and being a part of this amazing week. With that, I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to Patrick and the team at USGS. Again, thank you so much for being here. So excited to hear everything you have to share with us today. Great, thanks very much, Elizabeth. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. I see we have 174 participants. We're thrilled to be able to share with you some of the science that the USGS does in support of invasive species prevention and management. My name is Patrick Kuchowski. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager for the USGS. And I'm joined today by several of our research scientists from three different regions and five of our centers uh, across the country. They're gonna share with you their research on modeling and decision science that forms a foundation for many of the management actions for controlling invasive species. I'm not gonna take a lot of their time. I'm gonna let our speakers do the talking for us. And first up today is uh, Kristen Hart uh, with her co-author, uh, Amy Yackel Adams, and they will be sharing with you some of their research on invasive species in the Everglades. So again, thanks everyone for joining. Hope you, uh, hope you enjoy the seminar today and I see Kristen and Amy are on, so please take it away. Um, a more appropriate title for today's talk will actually be um... Informing Management Decisions of Invasive Burmese Pythons in the Greater Everglades. Our title on the agenda was Vital Rates of Burmese Pythons in the Everglades, which is where this is going. Um, but this is really a collaborative approach. And our team includes myself, Amy Eckel Adams, Jacqueline Guzzi, Andrea curry -Lowe, Margaret Hunter, Matthew McAllister from the Park Service, and Christina Romagosa from the University of Florida. Okay, structured decision making is often employed for very complex decisions, and this entails several key steps. 
identifying the decision maker or makers and the scale, precisely defining decision problems and objectives, developing alternatives, considering consequences, assessing uncertainty, and evaluating trade-offs. And all of this is incredibly complex for the greater Everglades, an expansive wilderness area of significant ecological value that is really collectively managed by local, state, and federal agencies, such as the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the South Florida Water Management District, the National Park Service, NOAA, Estuary and Research Reserves, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge System and Tribes. We think that a decision science framework really is critical to the success of Burmese Python management. Managers do not manage the pythons themselves, but rather actions that result in an impact on pythons or py python populations. And this decision analysis really iterative process is illustrated in this figure from Hemming et al. in 2021. It involves defining the problem, uh, measuring uh, or coming up with performance measures, thinking about alternatives, estimating consequences, evaluating trade-offs, then deciding and implementing all the while monitoring and learning. And the image on the right here is from EdMaps, a geospatial database that includes Python observations, among other things. And it doesn't necessarily represent individual specimens in Florida, but the, it's clear that the Python problem that we have is a landscape scale issue crossing many landholder boundaries. For the Python problem, the decision makers are the managers. So major land managers in South Florida are shown here, and they have different and often possibly conflicting goals. However, the shared current understood goal is to reduce and contain the established Burmese Python population and minimize the ecological impacts of this damaging invader. I guess when we were putting this presentation together, we thought about this quote, a decision is a choice between alternative options. And this is from Howard, 1966. With respect to decisions in Python management, the Python problem includes the challenges such as multiple competing objectives, intangible objectives, scarce resources, different stakeholders, different value judgments, and lots of uncertainty. To date, Python research is focused on improving detection of this invader. It's notoriously low. We need to quantify the impacts of pythons on native prey communities and really define the movement metrics and home ranges to understand what the scale of the problem is. As the topic of our session today is decision science, we thought to comment on the one structure, structure decision making workshop that many of us have been a part of. Um, that was related to Waxahachie National Wildlife Refuge and it was conducted in 2014. This workshop was focused on decisions related to the refuge specifically. And the topic was how management should respond to the threat of pythons. It wasn't clear if they were there yet or what was going to be the first sign that they were there. So the workshop did include managers and scientists, and it took place at the National Conservation Training Center. Key uncertainties after a week of meeting were outlined to include low detection, poor understanding of the python population dynamics, and unknown effectiveness of ongoing surveillance and control strategies. After years of productive but often separate research projects, which I'll list on the next slides, several of us researchers joined forces across two different USGS science centers, and we established a collaborative group of PIs to tackle what we saw as one of the biggest hurdles in Python science. Almost no information was available on vital rates for this species. And therefore, we had very little to shape decisions or decision science to then inform management. Without these key demographic data, such as survival and population growth rates and re reproductive parameters, we really cannot evaluate how specific control tools are influencing the Python population. So we joined forces to prioritize obtaining these vital rates for pythons. And this is a big challenge, admittedly one of the biggest of my own career. The vital rates used to construct life tables are some of the very basic data needed to estimate survival and abundance. And these are fundamental to evaluate control and removal efforts that are ongoing. Specifically, these data are necessary to generate a structured population model for estimating population size to inform management, that is, quantify success of removal programs or direct control efforts, which is to identify the age or size or stage that most influences population growth for this species. The next several slides just show the scope of the research that has occurred over the last several decades. It, they're all very valuable contributions to understanding um, Python biology and ecology. 
And they range from tracking and removal studies to diet, demography, reproduction, genetics, tracking and biologging, um, some modeling, um, determining impacts, and then survival, blood chemistry, and growth rates. We've learned a lot about python biology, but the biggest thing is they are very hard to work on, primarily because of the difficult detection issues. Um, also because several aspects of their biology make them very successful invaders. And this includes their cryptic coloration. They're primarily nocturnal. They have actually very secretive behavior. They do spend a lot of time submerged in water or concealed under vegetation, and they do not readily enter traps. There is basically very low um, detection, visual or through trapping. Um, they're a generalist predator. They have high fecundity. They have early age at sexual maturity. They're highly adaptable, and they have a high tolerance of extreme environmental conditions, such as salinity, heat, and cold. They have organ, regenerative organ growth, and recently rediscovered multiple paternity. The photo on the right on the top depicts a python that ate an adult deer, and the image on the bottom right depicts a python with 87 developing eggs. So it is difficult to show how hard the detection issue is with pythons, but these images illustrate how python cryptic coloration contributes to low individual detection for the species. And there actually is a python in each picture. I'm not sure if you can find it. <laughs> when Patrick asked us about presenting today, we agreed and decided to present our work in the context of decision science, not because we have the perfect example of a well-done structured decision-making case study, but more to engage about how this might be part of our current collaborative work um, that is focused on vital rates, but will help to improve the inter interpretation of what those vital rates mean. And just to clarify, we researchers are aiming to get these vital rates, which is age or size specific survival, sex ratios, age or size of maturity, reproductive output and frequency, population growth rates, and dispersal information. We want to do this to inform control tool efficacy. So for example, our removal rates are removal efforts currently happening, accomplishing anything towards population declines. With vital rate estimates, we can model the population growth rates to evaluate the removal scenarios on the overall population trends. In the process of conducting the vital rates work, we're obtaining additional biological information and eventually will inform future potential management strategies that are under consideration, such as use of genetic biocontrol for this invader. The current vital rate study includes a significant radio tracking field study on adult females and known age hatchlings. And through this study, we are targeting and beginning to collect key information on most of these vital rates. So for females, our, we're looking at reproductive output and frequency, effect of female body size on clutch size, hatching success and survival. And ultimately, we're going to model the population growth potential based on this information. We're looking at sex ratios produced per clutch and the size specific adult survival. For known age hatchlings, we are assessing age-specific survival, age and size of maturity, and dispersal. So in this vital rates work, we're using some aspects of the decision science framework, but on the science side. We are consistently assessing alternatives, consequences, uncertainty, and trade-offs in the overall project plan. There is, and has been, a do-nothing option, which we decided was not ideal. Managers must deal effectively with this species, thus our study. We're well into a deep dive of our previously collected radio tracking data on adult pythons, and it is producing useful initial survival estimates in a known fate um, framework. We're moving forward with our fieldwork after over a year of planning, strategizing, meeting with partners and funders, and we're exploring alternative models. Um, so we have a, a bit of a view to the future too. We're looking to estimate abundance using things like close kin mark recapture. We are also exploring robust removal models. And with this, the necessary data may not yet exist, but that doesn't mean we're not also aiming to collect it. So we're in the cycle of learning with pythons, um, which this little figure shows, but it does often seem like we're driving the car while building it. I don't know if everyone feels this way, but it certainly is the case for pythons. Um, this picture on the right illustrates this, where an arboreal python is not detected if you're looking down. Um, and this was a bit of a surprise when we're designing studies to detect pythons where you're doing visual surveys. So we are making progress in some uh, towards better management decisions together. Our team has designed the first really robust study to begin to estimate the vital rates. We're collecting the baseline data necessary to develop a population model and a life table. We need the vital rates to interpret the removals. Is it a drop in the bucket? 
we need to evaluate the female right, female vital rates, especially um, as in all life tables, they're female based, to accurately model the population scenarios and trajectories and determine likely consequences of management actions. And in this way, we feel that vital rates can be a decision tool to evaluate the alternative actions. Our research challenges with pythons are many, and they include the very low detectability, a very difficult environment. They're far from roads. We do need air support, um, helicopters or airplanes. We have several staff required to handle these large snakes, and there just seems to be no silver bullet. But we will press on. <laughs> we have lots of people to thank at USGS, including both of our science centers for support. But Nick Amon with the USGS Priority Ecosystem Science Program has been instrumental in this. James English, Earl Campbell, Cindy Tan, and Patrick Kosofsky with the USGS Bio Threats and Invasives Program have been very supportive. Uh, we have University of Florida interns, of course, the National Park Service, Skip Snow is now retired, Tylen Dean, Brian Falk, Tony Furness, who is also just now retired, Kevin Don Moyer, and um, Melody Naja. The Zoo Miami, Chris Smith, our vet, and the photo credits are all USGS. So we can take some questions if we have time. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, great presentation, and we do have a few minutes for questions. I see Elizabeth Brown put in the chat, so please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box, but you can also use the hand raise feature. Okay, I guess you're off the hook now for questions. Uh, thanks again. Great presentation. I'll just add on a personal note, um, as the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager, I don't get a chance to interact as much with the terrestrial community. And something I'm very much looking forward to in the near future is actually getting down and trying to get my hand on a python. Actually participate in the hands-on portion of it. That, that sounds like a blast to me. You are welcome anytime. So we did yeah, have a couple actually, of questions I, pop in. Um, Patrick, I think folks were just taking a minute to type them up, but there's, there's one question in the Q&A and two in the chat. Okay, I see in the Q&A, uh, the use of dogs has proven effective against pythons. Will that be something we look into? So all the management tools can be evaluated. Uh, certainly, there will be an enumeration of labor hours and uh, I guess what it got, you know? So those kinds of things are not applied right yet at the landscape scale, but certainly those kinds of cost-benefit analyses can come through. There's a dog right now in, involved in the study that we have in Key Largo. And so whether he detects the Python is being recorded. And so those kinds of things can be evaluated over time. Great. Uh, another question from the chat. Are you using drones with infrared? Not yet. Okay, so is that something that's on your near-term horizon or is, that, is this a new question that you'll possibly take up with your partners? I've heard that there has been some development of an infrared type of tool. I believe the University of Central Florida developed it, and I haven't seen it applied at the landscape scale yet or at the pilot scale yet in the wild. We have been part of, maybe a decade ago now, some efforts in the Park Service, but the thermal signature of the python is not drastically different from the environment, so it's quite difficult to detect a python with us, with the sensors that were available, it is very possible that things in the future could um, be changing because technology is always improving. Personally, I'd like to see pythons glow. <laughs> that would be way better for any kind of detection tool, but that's a pipe dream right now. There are glowing mice out there, so you know, maybe that's something that can happen in the future. But there are certainly new tools that are being developed now that hopefully can be applied for even better detection at a pilot scale and then worked out into better detection across the landscape. And I'll add to that, Kristen, that we'll be working with the University of Florida in assessing the use of drones, but in a radio telemetry capacity. Can drones be used to, to make radio tracking of pythons more cost effective? Um, that is a pending proposal. We're not sure if that will go through, but that's on the docket if it's funded. Okay, great. We have one more question, but only about 20 seconds to answer it. Are resource managers using traps with novel toxicants to cause python mortality as a removal technique? And there's looks like there's a couple other questions ahead of that, but 
take a quick stab at that, just a few seconds, and then perhaps try to answer those in the chat if you could. Yeah, I don't think so, partly because of all the native animals that could get in and possibly ingest those types of things. So it's, it's not selective enough of a tool. And we're, there's lots of rare and rare species that everyone's concerned about. So okay, great. Thanks very much, Kristen. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we're going to have to stop questions now and move on to our next speaker. If you could take a shot at answering some of the rest of those in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, and our next up is uh, Dr. Richie Erickson at UMass. He's going to talk about his big-headed carp population model. Take it away, Richie. Hi, my name is Richie Erickson. I'm out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. And for just as some background, if you're not familiar, invasive carp have been a problem in the U.S. since the 1970s. My research currently focuses on the big-headed carp, so that's big head and silver carp. They're two species, but uniquely in North America, the hy they hybridize and also their management is closely intertwined. Uh, these species originally showed up because they were used to stock and kill off a different, or try to keep rather, ponds clean. So fish farms would use them or industrial ponds to eat algae. Since that time, they've spread throughout the Mississippi River Basin and they cause lots of ecological impacts. Uh, for example, in parts of the Missouri River, they're up to 80 to 90 percent of the biomass of all fish, so they outcompete the native fish. And also the silver carp uh, jump up and smack people in the face because they're the ones that are the flying carp. As I get going, I want to thank my modeling team co leaders. It's Jan, Mark, and Ben from Fish and Wildlife. Jesse and Mary Beth from USGS and Dave Coulter is also part of our core team. So it's lots of people working together to try to solve this invasive species problem. Also, we have lots of other collaborators and we're always looking for more people. It's really neat just to work with all these different agencies and researchers. I'd also like to note part of the modeling group is we work closely with the federal coordination. We work closely with Amy McGovern and the Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the Army Corps. So as we're doing the modeling, we're not just USGS siloed together, but we're working with the other federal agencies and other state partners as well. One way we do this is through MICRA. It's the Mississippi and Interstate Cooperative Resource Agent Association. And we work closely currently with the MICRA sub-basin coordinators as we're doing our out partner outreach. So it's not just the feds, we also love to work with our partners and other people. So for our modeling group, our vision is to support and inform management with modeling. And this ties closely into adaptive management or structured decision-making because oftentimes models help you see what's going on, what might happen and what is happening. Uh, secondly, we want to do a spatially linked demographic population model for the Mississippi River and the different sub-basins. And I'll present more of this later, uh, the modeling details. And then last, as we're getting all this data together, how can we help do other types of quantitative assessments as well? Not just the current ongoing modeling, but other types of questions as well. So today I'm going to describe our ongoing efforts and how they tie into adaptive management. Also, what lessons we've learned from the Illinois River. And I'll talk in a little bit about why we focused on the Illinois River so much. And then also how we apply these lessons elsewhere. So a common theme we like to do with USGS is if we develop a tool for one situation, we think, how can we apply this lessons elsewhere? For example, at the end of the last talk, Gavin asked a question because he's currently developing species specific lamprey asides and possibly some carp asides. And he's wondering how can we use these same development frameworks to maybe develop a Python specific control tool as well. So just for the history of these modeling efforts, it's worth just laying this out so you see how it all came together. It started off with the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee, which has since been named, renamed the Invasive Carp Regional Coordinating Committee, was created about 2010 when the carp started to get in the Illinois River and there was concern that they were going to get into the Great Lakes via con a connection in Chicago as part of the Chicago Sanitary Canal and other networks there. So they went to Jim Garvey and others at Southern Illinois University and said, we want to compare different management strategies. So can you help us with a population model? And they did. They originally created a paper that was published in 2013 that treated the Illinois River as a single population. But they looked at size within the model. And a really big take home from this modeling work was showing that if you want to collapse the entire population 
in the river, you have to harvest all the fish. You can't just harvest big fish, but also small fish. But a really important missing gap from this paper was the different pools, because the Illinois River is unique in that the lower three pools where the carp occur have recruitment, but the upper three do not. And the upper three are the ones closest to the invasion front. So people were wondering, what's the importance of the spatial dynamics? So Dave Glover and Jan were both postdocs at SIU at the time and later went on to Ohio. And they created a spatially explicit invasive carp population model or sea carp. And this was originally done for the Illinois River and we're currently peer reviewing the paper now and getting it out and have also been developing the model. So that was the initial solution for that. And I'll talk about that model more today, but it, that's the, the history. And then there's been lots of people involved with that. These are some of the main agencies and places that have helped. And this was also funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative because the work was to keep the carp out of the Great Lakes because we're concerned about all the damage they might do there. So for this work, there's a monitoring response working group, part of the ACRCC Merwig. And this group funds our work with a template and we work directly with managers that way. So the two co-chairs, one is Brian from the Illinois DNR. It used to be Kevin Irons, he's recently been promoted. The other person is John Detmers, who's representing the Great Lakes perspective as well. And with them, we have a template, you can see the title here. But then in the river, there's the lower three pools, the Alton pool, the LaGrange and Peoria that all have recruitment. And then the smaller up three pools, Starved Rock, Marcells and Dresden. And then there's also some electric barriers upstream as well that currently are run by the Army Corps to keep carp out of the Great Lakes. So the objectives of the modeling group are to, we want to model to help the managers inform decision-making. So for example, where should they harvest the fish? Where is the best spot to put the harvest effort in? Likewise, if we're doing other control tools, for example, at the tur turret at a lock and dam downriver, where is the best lock and dam to place it at? Uh, it's also, we provide data collection and research recommendations. For example, where do we need more data? What should be collected where? And we work closely with the managers, and then also the other groups as part of Merwig. Last, we want to just say, okay, we've got this data, but how can we use it to also assess the current population dynamics and also ongoing control efforts? So it's the modeling is very closely linked to adaptive management for the system. And we've also been able to take these lessons to go outside the Illinois River. The sea cart model, we're currently working to apply to other sub-basins. And then for this, uh, we're currently working with the Upper Mississippi River and the Cumberland Tennessee Rivers. The UMR, because there's the invasion risk and Minnesota DNR is a welcome partner who has some questions they want us to work and they also have data. And then likewise, Mark Rogers at Tennessee Tech has some really good partnerships with the Tennessee Cumberland. And he would be another great person to talk to because they actually have had done structured decision-making workshops for that river. A different part of the Illinois River is, is the stock recruitment relationship, which I'll talk about. And then also catch at age length. So these are different types of models, so not just a traditional population model, but other types as well. And then we're also exploring a per capita metapopulation model that's simpler than the full blown population model. Uh, and then we use these to assess invasive carp removal effectiveness. And then again, it's, we see what data do we need and how does it impact management? So we can work with the managers and say, is it worthwhile to collect extra data in pool A or pool B? Where do we need data to help you make decisions? And also what are your questions? So the CCART model has been the star, and this is a model that's used for uh, scenario planning. It's what ifs, like a climate model where it's under this scenario, what will happen? And then it's also, where do we need more data? It's something when you just, anytime you do a model, you have to articulate your assumptions and what are your gaps? So with CCARP, our input data are telemetry, length at age, hydroacoustics of the fish, the maturity, especially when do females become mature and what's the relationship between length and weight? We then put these into a model where we look at the movement 
across the different pools, how the fish grow, their mortality rates, recruitment. And then with the outputs of the model, we can compare different harvest strategies, deterrence, and say, what are our critical assumptions and where do we need data? And we do this as ongoing dialogue with the managers so that it's not just a modeling group, but we work closely with the Illinois DNR and then also John Detmers, we're in regular communication with as well. So it's getting the key stakeholders engaged for both the data collection and management needs. And that's really, it's very close to adaptive management, even though it's not always called that with the Illinois River. So staff recruitment, if you're not familiar with it, basically as spawner biomass increases, the number of recruits generally increases until you get a density effect and it decreases. And we're quantifying this for a couple of reasons. One is it's central to the population dynamics. If this relationship doesn't exist, then there's really no reason to control the population if the biomass isn't related to recruits. We know it is, so we want to quantify it. Also, this can help us understand what's going on with exploitation. Is the harvest effective? Where are we at on this curve? What should management do? What's going on? Approaches, Dave Coulter from Southern Illinois is leading this effort, so I don't know as much of the details, but we're collaborating with the other groups. There's a monitoring and also a hydroacoustics group as part of the Merwig for the Illinois River. And we're working with them to use their existing data for their hydroacoustics and the age structuring. So this is a chance where it's not only adaptive management, but it's also integrating data across different groups of people and we work together. So with the Illinois results, we've been able to control compare harvest strategies so for these harvest strategies, perhaps counterintuitively, unless you really think about population dynamics a lot, is that it actually makes more sense to uh, do lower river pressure, lower river harvest, because these are the source populations where the upper river populations are sinks without recruitment. So you can, uh, under a lot of different situations, you actually have a bigger impact on population dynamics by harvesting away from the invasion front, which is, not always intuitive, but modeling can help us see that insight. We also have recommendations for data collection. For example, there aren't a lot of small invasive carp caught with current techniques. So we're working with the monitoring groups to try to get this needed demographic data to understand what's going on with the carp. Another important thing is standard aging. This is really important for the carp, but also really dif difficult. And then also understanding movement's important. So this is where we work with the telemetry group and talk with them and also help managers see how understanding the carp movement would help them understand the system dynamics as well. And again, just a big take home is it's really important for us to understand the movement of these fish, possibly more important than the demographic data, but this wouldn't be obvious without modeling to help show and quantify. So we've been able to move outside the Illinois River as well. It's because of, increased U.S. Department of Interior funding for the six sub-basins of the Mississippi River. These carp are bad and cause lots of problems. But we developed these tools for the Illinois River and we're going to apply them elsewhere as well. So our ongoing goals, first, we're just getting stakeholders together to see who's interested in using adaptive management. Uh, we want to be partners. We don't want to, we can't and don't want to club people over the head and say, come join us. It's if DNRs or different groups, tribes, anybody want to join us in different states, we're happy to have them at the table and work with them and coordinate, but we don't force anybody to join us. We're just here to support people who want help. And then it's also identifying what data exists and where, what's the limitations of this data? What would more data get us? And what's the best bang for the buck as we collect more data? And if possible, we're trying to do some proof of concept model runs with these tools for other sub-basins. And this is ongoing work. So it might just be a theoretical model run where it's we have pools set up in the upper Mississippi River, but it's not very realistic data. But we can say getting the data would give us this extra information. Is it worth it to you as a manager or is your model money better spent somewhere else? So current steps, we have the extendable model for the non-Illinois River, and this has been published as a USGS software tool. If you want access, please shoot me an email or reach out via chat and I can share these links. So there's a population part, there's a telemetry model, which Jesse 
one of the co-leads is working on. And then we're taking these to the UMR, as I mentioned. It's, we chose the UMR because there's existing data and collaboration. Minnesota DNR has been great to work with. And we're also open to anybody else who's on this call and is interested in joining. We've talked to people at the University of Minnesota and other places as well. So lots of opportunities. Then also the Ohio, Tennessee, and Cumberland rivers, these two sub-basins, we're interested in these because there's data. I mentioned a structured decision-making workshop, collaborations, and also congressional priorities. Congress expressed specific interest in these rivers because of the people who were funding it. So Mark Rogers is currently doing this work there. And then current steps. So one thing that really emerged is just data curation needs. So just how we manage data as partners is something that's really important, especially when you get different state agencies and federal agencies involved. It's something that just, it's good to have conversations about and say, how do we want to share it? What are you comfortable sharing? And that's something that's ongoing. We're also looking for more partners. If you want, shoot me an email and I'm happy to add you to our monthly calls. Or if you want to add data or be involved, we're always looking for more people. And then just another plug, we have monthly calls for the population modeling groups where we cycle through the different sub-basins. The more the merrier and we're happy to have people join us. Future goals. One is we're just trying to identify management goals outside of Illinois. So this is working with the stakeholders to see what do they want. Illinois is pretty clear. Keep them out of the Great Lakes and minimize damage to the Illinois River. The UMR, it's Minnesota wants to keep them out of the inland waterways, it seems, and then also slow down or stop their spread. Uh, it's applying the models with data to help managers, so that closely ties us in as well. Then what are the data gaps and how do we fill these and what's the best data to collect given limited resources? We're also looking to automate so we can do regular updates, basically load the data and press a button and get the models to automatically update. So a key portion of this is a database. Then we do the model runs. And then uh, next we're also looking at stock assessments. So not just predictive models, but backcasts back models to understand what's going on with the stock. So are we being effective in the cart or does management need to maybe be adjusted or adaptive? And then also we're looking to expand beyond the three current sub-basins. And we're currently working with the micro sub-basin coordinators on this for outreach. So it's not USGS is reinventing the wheel or something. We're working closely with our Fish and Wildlife Service partners and their existing collaborative relationships as well. So Key takeaways, if you want to do modeling with adaptive management, one is identify your management goals. It really helps everyone. And sometimes it is just the modeling group saying, or the modeler saying, what's important to you to get managers to clearly articulate it? Because yeah, we want to kill the invasive species or stop its spread, but what is a clear articulate goal? And then Data management's really important as you get bigger projects. I don't think people a decade ago when they started the CARP work were thinking, how do we manage this data for a decade? But now it's something they have to do. And as we continue to move forward, we're learning more about this and everybody is. Then also think long-term if possible. So yeah, you wanna get out and kill those python, kill those CARP, kill any, kill the invasive species, but it's probably gonna be a marathon, not a sprint. So how do you set up systems for the marathon? Uh, this is just a slide of me from a ski race last year with my baby. One year, she's one year old now, so that's the end of my slides. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I see there are some questions as well. Yeah, thanks Richie. And next up is Ryan Jackson with our Central Midwest Water Science Center. He will give another example of how models developed and used by the USGS work in decision-making for management of invasive carps. Ryan, take it away. Thank you, Patrick. So um, I'm gonna turn off my camera here in a second as soon as I'm done introducing myself. But uh, uh, So I'm Ryan Jackson, I'm a hydrologist with the USGS Central Midwest Water Science Center. So a little bit different background than most of the biologists uh, that are presenting today. But I'll be talking about drift modeling to inform decision-making 
in management of invasive carps. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video for now. I've got some <coughs> videos within this uh, this presentation, so hopefully it'll play. All right. So first, I think, and first and foremost, I think it's important to to make sure that it's clear what I mean by, by drift modeling. Um, so drift modeling is modeling of transport and development of biological um, particle subject occurrence in rivers, lakes, and the ocean. Um, you can see on the left, this is an example of drift uh, of dye, uh, so the advection and dispersion of dye uh, along a river. Um, to that, we add, so basically, that's showing our hydrodynamic components, you know, how it, uh, it spreads that dye out along the river um, and disperses those uh, those dye particles, but with the drift modeling that we're going to be talking about with relation to invasive carp, we add in the biological components of life history. Uh, so the, if we're modeling eggs in this case, those eggs and larvae are developing uh, as they move downstream and changing physical properties. So we're trying to really pair the hydrodynamics with this um, um, biology that's occurring at the same time. And uh, it's really system that we're trying to, to model. So I think it's important that you gave the history of invasive carps uh, and why they're problematic. I think one thing that I'd like to touch on to make sure that it's clear is that invasive carps are pelagic spawners. They're reliant on river currents during reproduction. And so if we're talking about, for instance, grass carp in, in Lake Erie, which will be a subject of uh, this presentation for the most part, we're those uh, particular grass carp, uh, when they look to reproduce, they find a, a, a suitable spawning tributary. They move up that tributary from the lake and um, spawn those eggs, then drift downstream for a period of time until they hatch. Um, and that, that time is dependent on the water temperature. Um, once they hatch, they're able to swim vertically, so they're no longer these negatively buoyant eggs that must remain in suspension. They can keep themselves in suspension. And then finally, they reach a gas bladder inflation stage at which they begin to swim laterally. And so they can then start to seek out nursery habitat. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of drift modeling, uh, the importance here is that drift models can predict the locations of, of eggs and larvae downstream as a function of time uh, from a known or suspected spawning site. Uh, and it includes, it tells you times and locations of critical stages of development. For instance, where eggs will hatch uh, downstream of a, a particular site where they spawn or uh, where they reach gas bladder inflation, which is important for identification of nearby nursery habitat. Drift modeling of invasive carps really helps management agencies uh, in a number of ways uh, for risk assessments to identify uh, potential uh, suitable spawning rivers uh, for Invasive carps identify river conditions which may have the highest potential for recruitment. Um, in this case, that would be, in the case of tributaries of the Great Lakes, that would be uh, um, in-river hatching of, the, of those eggs uh, so they don't settle out within the low velocity region of the lake. And then finally, to inform crews when and where to sample. Um, if you have um, um, crews going out to sample for Early, early detection, for instance, where do you send them and when uh, so that they can capture eggs within that plume. So uh, our invasive carp team within the USGS developed uh, what's called FluEgg or a fluvial egg and drift model. It was developed specifically for invasive carp that's generally applicable to other species uh, if we know growth rate and, and those functions. Um, it was initially developed as a tool to help agencies identify which Great Lakes tributaries are suitable for spawning, uh, based primarily on hydrodynamics and the ability to keep eggs in suspension uh, after hatching. And so it's um, those negatively buoyant eggs rely on turbulence within the water column to, to hatch. And so we basically programmed in uh, this hydrodynamic, um, um, uh, the hydrodynamics within the river and then the, the interaction with these, these eggs and the critical components of the interaction between the physics and the biology. So in 2013, Fluid was initially released uh, and its first case study 
in the in this paper was on the Sandusky River, which is tributary to the Great Lakes in Ohio, or tributary to Lake Erie in particular. And two prior studies had looked at the Sandusky River to determine if it could support invasive carp spawning. Uh, Kachowski, 2012, looked at it uh, along with other tributaries to Lake Erie. And they used a criteria of a passable length or unrestricted length, so no dams, of uh, 100 kilometers and a velocity of 70 centimeters per second. And then water temperatures above 21 C. And the, this really came from uh, observ observations of where carp spawn in, in uh, Asian rivers uh, and was used as kind of the criteria at the time. And it was concluded that they could uh, support, the Sandusky could support invasive carp spawning provided Ballville Dam was, was removed. And it was, it was scheduled to be removed at the time uh, but it wasn't removed until 2018. Uh, <clears throat> Murphy and Jackson, we followed up in 2013, so shortly thereafter with a drift analysis uh, based on field data. And so this was, while Fluid was in development, uh, we did some field studies where we placed crews on the water and they collected data during a high flow event that would be, quote unquote, a spawning event um, for invasive carp. In this case, Baldville Dam was in place and we came to the same conclusions that invasive carp could uh, um, uh, drift to the point of hatching within the lower uh, uh, Sandusky River, which is less than 20, 25 kilometers in length. So it's a quarter of what was previously thought uh, to be a, a dr necessary drift length. And eggs were in suspension down to 15 centimeters per second, or uh, we concluded that the eggs could remain in suspension down to 15 centimeters per second. So this was important because uh, it's very different than what was thought required at the time. And, and so we followed up with a fluid analysis um, using the fluid model when it was ready shortly later, later that year in 2013. And it, it concluded the same, uh, supported the same findings that the lower Sandusky could support spawning with Baldwin Dam in, in place. So this was an important conclusion and, and one that uh, then uh, shortly thereafter, all within, so this is 2013 again, um, it was, there was the first evidence for invasive carp spawning, in particular grass carp spawning in the Great Lakes Basin. And it was based on individuals that were found um, that had, that showed that there were naturally recruit, uh, there was natural recruitment and and they were likely from the Sandusky River based on otolith uh, microchemistry. And so this, this was important because before this uh, flu egg was really being used to, from risk assessment standpoint, is a tributary suitable for invasive carp spawning. And then we began to ask the question now with evidence of recruitment in the Sandusky River, can flu egg determine when and where uh, grass carp spawn within the Sandusky River. So it's a much different question that, that we're asking in this case. And so we're moving from a risk-based kind of analysis uh, use of fluid to more of a uh, management and control effort-based um, um, information mechanism with the model results. So it, with this recruitment, evidence of recruitment and um, the modeling results that suggest that yes, the Sandusky River could be utilized. Uh, they moved to um, further um, uh, monitoring efforts within the Sandusky River. And in 2015, eight grass carp eggs, fertilized grass carp eggs were found in the Sandusky River, being the first evidence of, of spawning in this case. So we have evidence of spawning and recruitment in the Sandusky River. Um, and this was in response to that recruitment evidence for 2013 and ultimately it became a management priority to identify where grass carp spawn uh, within the, the Sandusky River. So this became the new challenge for Fluig was, was trying to take this model, model and, and ask a, a new question or have it answer a, a new question and that question is if we know where uh, eggs and larvae are captured within a system, can we backtrack and predict where they were spawned? And this is basically an inverse source problem. Um, and so the, the nice thing about uh, 
uh, invasive carp eggs and larvae is that they're little biodata loggers. They, there's a record of, of development there that one can extract if you need water temperature and then be able to predict the time that they were spawned uh, based on developmental rates from laboratory studies. And so you can at least get a pretty good estimate of when they were spawned. And if you're able to model the hydrodynamics in the river uh, during that, that spawning event, um, you can utilize this different methods to, to estimate where that spawning location could be. And this was done in several ways. The first was with the Monte Carlo-based iteration method. So the same uh, student, Holly Emke, that found the eggs um, within the river then utilized Fluig and a Monte Carlo method to essentially iterate through. So she started with these spawning locations downstream of Ballville Dam, which was in place at the time. And um, she, she chose a spawning location, she modeled it in Fluig and looked where that that egg plume was at the time of uh, egg capture. And if that uh, egg plume overlapped her capture location, uh, it, it provided a, a, a probable spawning location. And so she did this many times uh, and ultimately ended up with a distribution, probability distribution of spawning locations um, and, and the most probable spawning location that I'll, I'll show here in a minute. Now, the other way to do this that was uh, now built into Fluig into our modeling package is the uh, reverse time particle tracking method. Essentially what this does is runs the model in reverse. Of, so you put eggs uh, within the model in at the capture location, reverse the flows in the river, essentially run the, the model backwards in time from the time of capture to the time of fertilization or t equals zero. And um, you can do this with a single simulation. Uh, the one problem is that dispersion is not reversible. So you don't end up with a point location. Um, you end up with a spawning area similar to um, a probable spawning area that's similar or a distribution is similar to what would be predicted by um, the Monte Carlo method. So it's a comparison on the right here of the two different methods and uh, for the Illinois River with silver carp spawning locations. And we get pretty good um, um, agreement between the two different methods, the forward with the iterative approach and this reverse particle tracking. But the, the advantage is with reverse particle tracking, it's a single simulation that's required. So back to our uh, initial problem of identifying that, that most probable spawning location for those 2015 eggs, that was identified uh, just downstream of Brady's Island sorry, just upstream of Brady's Island on the Sandusky River, uh, and later confirmed after, in 2018, additional fertilized eggs as well as adult grass carp in, in spawning aggregations were uh, captured, and all within uh, a kilometer of that predicted spawning site from the fluid analysis. Um, we've moved all the way from, it's a potential spawning river to verified spawning and a, a verified spawning location um, in, a, in a pretty short time. All this goes into uh, then the management agencies uh, take all this information into a stru structured decision making um, process guided by um, the Michigan State University and the, the priority here is a decision makers in determining of objectives and control actions for invasive grass carp in Lake Erie. And ultimately what came out of this was uh, through participatory modeling and expert elicitation, uh, four different uh, scenarios were evaluated and it was determined that removal efforts that concentrated uh, on areas of high catchability, so in this case it's spawning areas um, and spawning aggregations, when paired with a spawning barrier, on the Sandusky River could control grass carp in Lake Erie, provided all their model assumptions are met. And so our, our fluid modeling essentially comes into play in terms of uh, feeding into this expert elicitation, but at the same time, it's actually uh, then uh, being used on the, the output side of the SDM process to help meet those objectives. Um, and those objectives were identified, taken from this SDM process 
and worked into a grass, a grass carb response strategy by Ohio DNR in which they said, okay, we need to remove 390 grass carp from Lake Erie annually with our strike teams and commercial fishermen. And we need to uh, look at evaluating the feasibility of a seasonal or uh, spawning barrier on the Sandusky and Maumee rivers. So their annual removal uh, of 390 grass carp, um, they, they uh, basically defined strike teams that wanted to target grass carp on known spawning events because they're high catchability. That's where they know the carp are going to be um, at a certain time of year um, and in certain flow rates. So they're going to target these spawning areas during these high probability spawning events. And flow rate modeling in this case informs uh, decisions on when and where to send strike teams. <clears throat> and then further, uh, we've worked that. Uh, so th this, the first two bullets there are informed by FluEgg and results from FluEgg. And then we can take that and combine it with uh, additional knowledge and um, forecasts from the National Weather Service as well as uh, forecasts that, that we develop to, to basically give a forecast of spawning conditions for uh, a particular, particular river. In this case, is, this is the Sandusky River uh, forecast for grass carp where um, we can give this information on to strike teams to, to allow them to prep and, uh, and mobilize for deployments up to five days ahead of time. And then finally, for the Sandusky River Seasonal Barrier, um, they uh, uh, consultant evaluated the feasibility of both a physical as well as a behavioral barrier um, as identified by SDM. Uh, and the goal here was to keep mature uh, grass carp from migrating upstream and reaching spawning areas, uh, as well as to potentially aid in removal efforts uh, if you can redirect those fish and, and trap them. Uh, you're not only preventing them from reaching their spawning area, but you're also uh, aiding in removal efforts. And in this case, the barrier location is critical to its efficacy. Uh, it must be downstream of the known or suspected spawning areas. Uh, there must be a limit, limited downstream drift distance. So if carp were to spawn, for instance, at your barrier, uh, ideally there's not enough drift distance downstream for them to develop to hatching before reaching the lake and settling out of the water column. And the site must be compatible with a chosen barrier. And so our fluid mining really can, can help identify uh, uh, that location and, and assess locations to make sure it's um, a suitable location and meets the objectives of, of uh, disruption of, of spawning and recruitment. So ultimately, FluEgg uh, drift modeling informs decision making uh, and management of invasive carbs, especially when actions are targeted at reproduction. Information from FluEgg is used uh, at many points throughout the decision making process from risk assessment uh, to response efforts uh, it's used as input to structured decision making as well as used to meet the objectives identified uh, in SDM uh, as we saw with grass card uh, by guided removal of spawning aggregations as well as evaluation of seasonal barrier placement and operation so with that I'll take any questions thank you Thanks very much, Ryan, for that informative walk through the uh, grass carp world from the very beginnings to where we stand now with uh, decision science. That was fantastic. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, and I don't see any questions in the question and answer box. If anyone has questions for Ryan, please go ahead and type those in uh, throughout the rest of the session. Next up is uh, Dave Smith. And we're gonna transition now from talking about some of the specific models that have been used that go into decision-making to the decision-making process, guided decision-making process itself. So Dave, when you're ready to go, the floor is yours. Thanks, Patrick, and the other organizers of the symposium. It's a real pleasure to, to speak to you all. Um, as Patrick said, I'm going to provide an overview of structured decision-making 
And I'm going to emphasize uncertainty and risk and where that fits in because that's such an important element of, of invasive species control and management, but also in terms of just conservation or natural resource management in general. Um, and I'm going to talk about this from a more general point of view. Decision analysis is uh, a process that involves both social elements, it's already been alluded to already by the previous speakers, and also technical elements. So it's a socio-technical process that is really applies to a lot of, a lot of life's decisions, professional, personal, um, with the aim of trying to make better decisions, make those decisions better in some respect. The two case studies that will follow mine are going to really talk about applications to invasive species, so I'm going to talk more generally, and we've already heard some really good uh, examples previously. Um, we're tossing around some terms here. I just want to take a moment. We're talking about decision science, decision analysis, structured decision making. One way to think about this is that decision science is the kind of scientific discipline, the professional discipline. Decision analysis is application of the methodology that uh, developed under that discipline and structured decision making is a specific protocol. And there's others that kind of accomplish the same thing, but in our community of practice, we tended to follow this structured decision making nomenclature. But anyways, we're going from the general to the specific, just to make that clear. Um, I just want to apologize a little bit that I'm going to step back and start with kind of basics. But I think it is important that we all have a common understanding of what we're talking about. Um, and we'll talk about basically what is a decision and what makes a decision hard. Um, well, one, of the, one of the things that makes it hard that's ubiquitous in our work is uncertainty and risk. So we'll focus on that and uh, we'll use case studies. Uh, one example of, of the importance of not ignoring uncertainty is illustrated by this cartoon by Sam Savage, where uh, the statistician here in the uh, in, in in hard luck there he read a sign that said average depth of the stream is three feet, and knowing he can wade three feet of water, he waded out but found that uh, you know it's not actually three feet. It's not less than three feet everywhere. It's not wadeable everywhere. Okay, so what's a decision? Decisions are about the future. Um, Ron Howard, who's not the movie guy, but a, a, an engineer, he coined the term decision analysis, actually. And he's from Stanford. And he said, decisions are the only means that we have to change our future. So it is about the future. And the reason I say that is because we all know that the future is uncertain. And it's Know, and we've just lived through two years of trying to predict what's going to happen with regard to COVID and how many times have we been, have we missed the mark, really? It's really tough to, to, to make predictions about the future, but decisions are about the future. There, there's no avoiding that. Uh, decisions are also a conscious choice among alternatives and that they are irre irrevocable allocations of our time and our money, our resources. It's, something we cannot pull back completely. Not all decisions are have the same kind of importance in that regard. Like I could decide when I was commuting to the office, I could decide well, today I'm going to detour and go fishing. But on halfway there, I recalled that I have a meeting on my schedule and I turned around and came back. So I made a decision. I, I could change my mind without too much loss. But if I go to a car dealer and I decide I'm going to buy a car and I sign sign the, the agreement and pay money as soon as I drive the car off the lot I'm gonna I can't get back all that money even if I change my mind immediately I go back and eh, I've changed my mind well I've lost probably a good chunk of what, what I spent so let you know it's all about decisions are how we make how affect our future and they're really about uh, about our life as well as our professional uh, situations um, how do we know if we've made a good decision? 
I could, we can all think of situations where um, we may have uh, made a decision and, but they, and we thought that we took everything into account, but they didn't really turn out that well. And is that really a bad decision? Or we may think of, of situations we really didn't give it much hard thought at all, and we turn, it turned out quite well. Well, the, the reason is that there's, uh, part of the decision involves luck. And uh, we could wait until we get an outcome from a decision and kind of look back and, and decide the quality of the decision that way. But, oh, is that really fair? That, in fact, psychologists call that hindsight bias. You know, when, when something turns out well, we look back and we say, oh, I knew it all along. Or if, or if they didn't turn out all that great, we look back and we say, well, I should have known. And that's, it's one thing is it's not very compassionate on ourselves to think that way because we're not in control of everything. And the other is it really doesn't help us in the moment. What we need is a way to think about decisions when we make those decisions. Are we making a good quality decision? And that's really what decision analysis, structured decision making is all about. Okay, it's just some background stuff. Okay, so also when we make a decision, and here we have two decision makers, we have the skunk and the dog, they both have decisions to be made. And uh, we have objectives. In this case, the, the objectives are probably pretty simple. The dog wants, and the skunk both want to eat, uh, and they both want to avoid bad things from happening. The dog doesn't want to be sprayed and the, the skunk doesn't want to be bitten. Um, but there's uncertainty and there's potential harm and therefore there's risk. And when you're faced with this kind of uncertainty and risk, you could freeze up and not really know which way to turn. And uh, so we need to find a way in and uh, also in terms of evaluating alternatives, we need to find a way how to evaluate those alternatives when things get complicated, when things involve uncertainty and risk. And decision analysis is, has a toolbox of analytical techniques on, on how to do that. The other thing we want to keep in mind is that there may be uh, clear objectives and then there may also be hidden objectives. Like in this cartoon, uh, the dogs are talking over cocktails and they're business dogs. I and they, there's one says the other, it's not enough that we succeed, cats must also fail. I, I've probably been in some natural resource situations where there is an element of this, but this is pretty extreme. And hidden objectives don't necessarily always fall into this kind of extreme category, but it's not infrequent for decision makers or stakeholders to not be completely transparent and explicit about what they're trying to achieve and that's not necessarily intentional. It's really often hard to be aware of everything you're concerned about um, until you start to understand better the choices you have, the benefits and the cost um, that you face. So it's, it's part of this conflict of, of interest is part of our work. And when you have that, there's, there are two broad approaches to making decisions in this kind of collaborative environment that we work. One is advocacy. And there you're trying to, you know, you're really trying to advocate for a particular policy perspective. Um, and you may be the spokesperson who's gonna push forward, push a particular policy, and you can end up with winners and losers. Um, and if you have, you try to, push away anybody who has evidence that doesn't confirm your particular point of view and that sort of thing. We're pretty familiar with that. The other approach is inquiry and it's a collaborative problem solving. We're testing and evaluating. It's scientific in that way. We're trying to be critical thinkers. We're balancing arguments. We actually encourage minority views because we want to be robust to things that we don't think of ourselves and sometimes they come from, from views outside of our worldview and what we're striving for is building trust and achieving collective ownership. I think you see some of that in in the collaborative model building that was illustrated by previous talks. But the um, SDM, structured decision making decision analysis broadly, 
really falls into this inquiry case. Now, uh, why should we bother doing all this kind of nerdy thinking about decisions? We face a ton of decisions. We certainly don't need to analyze every one of them, but many of our decisions really are important enough that we want to think carefully about them and improve our chances of getting a good outcome. Not guaranteeing it, but it's certainly improving the chances. There are a couple key uh, elements of decision analysis or structured decision making. One is that we're focusing on the values. As folks had mentioned already, what is our management goal? We want to think about what our objectives are and discuss those first and let the rest of the analysis follow that. And that's intuitively, if we have to fight against our kind of uh, evolution almost. You know, intuitively, we want to jump right to our alternatives. And this kind of goes against that uh, knee-jerk approach, but there's lots of benefits to having value-focused thinking. The other key element is that it decomposes the problem into to policy or value aspects, science and knowledge aspects, um, and we bring, the, bring these together. And that's one thing that's really attracted me to this field. Um, model building can be informed by those policies as has been illustrated previously. The science can be informed by, by the, uh, the decision context and then the science can then help make the decisions better. Um, so PROACT, which is the protocol that's applied in structured decision-making is really a, a useful framework. It stems back uh, from uh, um, early, uh, late 20th century by Howard Rafa, who was uh, another godfather of, of the founder of decision science and decision analysis. Um, he's from Harvard. And so this kind of breaks up the problem into defining the problem or framing it, determining what your objectives are, identifying your alternatives, and you're doing this in kind of the sequence. You can go back and forth, but you do have this kind of sequence of things you think about. Forecasting the consequences, really the science part of this. Um, scientists also help figuring out what alternatives may potentially be uh, better than another. They don't necessarily advocate for a particular alternative. They're honest brokers in that sense. And then evaluating trade-offs can be complicated. It can involve optimization and science comes in there as well. And then you're taking additional steps to test the sensitivity of your decision to uncertainty and underlying assumptions. You're making the decisions, committing to action, and you're monitoring the outcome. So all those things are involved. So uncertainty is, are, is incorporated really in a complete way in decision analysis. You can have uncertainty in terms of framing of the decision, do we have the right temporal and spatial scale identified? Who's the decision maker? Who are the stakeholders? Getting real clarity on that. Um, what are the values that are important that need to be taken into account? Originally, when you start, there could be a lot of uncertainty there. What are some alternatives that could solve this problem? There's an engineering element to that, which when you first get started, and it's a creative step too. So when you first get started, there those things may not be clear. Um, you can't really identify the best, al the best alternative that you can identify is, has to be on the table. So you can't really have a better alternative. You can't have a better solution than the alternatives that are on the table. Um, and then you have to predict what will happen if you implement one alternative versus another in the terms of your objectives. So there's scientific uncertainty. And then, as I mentioned, Evaluating trade-offs can be complicated and might involve optimization, which is its own technical field. Um, uncertainty of risk. So uncertainty involves, they're not the same thing. And um, we often have uh, uncertainty to deal with, as I mentioned. Um, we, don't we can't really know the outcome of our action, so there's some probabilistic nature of, to that. And then there are some things we want to avoid. So there could be loss or injury that we want to avoid and that there's levels of that loss or injury. So there's impact that we that's possible. And this combination of impact and probability constitute risk. And that risk, the level of risk is really, as Sam Savage says, is in the eye of the beholder. So if you 
you've probably seen matrices like this on the right, where you have impact and likelihood of that impact. And the color of those, of that level of risk is a subjective thing. Like whether you call that risk low or medium or high is a value judgment. So um, it, this involves both kind of scientific technical stuff, but also personal value judgment stuff. Okay. So decision analysis is, has a collection of tools and to deal with uncertainty. One of those tools that is first thing you would turn to is the decision tree. And so I'm just gonna walk through a little example here where you have a new technology that you're trying to decide whether to implement or not. And there, you're not really sure how well this new technology will work. In this case, the new technology is something you you would implement in a hatchery situation where you're trying to produce a fry. And right now, with the old technology, you can produce 40,000 fry pretty reliably. If you implement this new technology, there's a chance it works well, in which case you would produce you almost, well, you wouldn't, you would increase it by a, a, a good factor, not quite double, but close. You could produce 70,000 fry. But if it doesn't work, you'd actually get less than what you have now. And uh, the probability of it working a priori is about 0.8 to 0.2. And so the question is, given that uncertainty, should you implement the, the new technology? And you could calculate expected values, or you could put it in, in terms of fry, or you could put it in terms of utility, which is more of a rel relative scale on how happy you, are fe you feel about these outcomes. And in either case, it looks like from a expected value point of view, you would probably implement the technology. So this decision tree allows you to evaluate decisions across uncertainty. Another tool in your toolbox is value of information. And imagine if you, in the same situation where you're thinking about new technology, what if you were able to test the technology first before you made the decision and you were able to resolve whether it would work or not? If you had that sort of test, if it worked, you would apply it. You would get 70,000 fry rather than 40,000. If it didn't work, you wouldn't apply it and you'd stick with what you have now, which is 40,000. Uh, so in that case, we still don't know if it works or not, but if you could test it, we would expect it would work 80% chance of it working. And so calculating your expected value, you get uh, 64,000 uh, rather than 58 or 40, in which case this, there is value in this test. So there is value of, in this additional information. How much value? Well, about 6,000 fry worth of value is what you would, and if you could monetize that, how much, how many dollars that would represent, that would give you a, a gauge for how much you should spend on that test. And then as we saw in some previous talks, <clears throat> sensitivity analysis is very useful. So what we're looking for when we're faced with a decision under uncertainty is that we're looking for robust alternatives, policies or alternative solutions that we know there's uncertainty. There's no really, we don't live in a world where there's, there's complete certainty. We have uncertainty. And so the question is, are, can we make a decision where um, it's regardless of this range of uncertainty, we're still making a good decision. So this is just a quick example here for restoration of an estuary in Herring River in, on Cape Cod. And we're looking at a number of different policy options for creating or restoring the hydrology. And uh, we know it's not important that we know what those policies are in detail, but they are the columns. And then we did a sensitivity analysis of looking at all the uncertainty that was part of this systems model. And if it, what we're looking for is the policies that ranked high. So one to seven policy, Ranking one means it's performing best. And we can see quickly that there are some policies that don't perform well under, uh, don't perform best under any uh, situation. We can rule them out. And then we have a few where that do perform best or second best. 
uh, under certain circumstances. And we have one policy in particular that seems to shine. It's not always the best, but it's nearly always the best. So we would say that this policy here in the middle is robust to uncertainty. And it doesn't determine our future. Some decisions warrant a, a rigorous approach, and that's what we're promoting here. Um, I'll just say that uh, Decision House provides a comprehensive approach to incorporating uncertainty risk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions offline. Thank you so much, Patrick. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, Aaron is going to take us through a specific example of structured decision making, followed by one more case study before we wrap up. Good morning. My name is Aaron Cup. I'm a research fish biologist with USGS at the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center that's here in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Today, I'll be giving an overview of a project that used decision analysis to help inform placement of invasive carp deterrents on the Tennessee River. Uh, it also start up by acknowledging co-authors of the presentation, Max Post Vandenberg and Dave Smith. Uh, Dave just presented. They were the independent observers for the project and really the brain power behind the modeling and SDM process. But also the USGS carp experts, Mark Rogers and Dwayne Chapman. <clears throat> All right, so for quick background, the Tennessee River is over 600 miles long. It flows through the states of Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Kentucky. The river contains nine major lock and dam structures. You can see those on the, this slide on that side elevation profile. The structures create nine separate reservoirs that are heavily used for recreational fishing, boating, and commercial navigation. Many of those dams were installed in the 1930s by TVA, that's the Tennessee Valley Authority, for flood control and hydropower. But the locks themselves are managed and operated by the Corps of Engineers for, uh, to support navigation. Uh, unfortunately, carp have made their way into lower portions of the Tennessee River. They're coming in from the Ohio River. Uh, and currently, Pickwick Reservoir is considered to be the leading edge of carp invasion. So there have been a few sporadic and I think unconfirmed detections above that location. So the overall management goal is to keep carp from entering the upstream reservoirs and to support that goal the Tennessee Valley Authority began a programmatic environmental assessment in 2020 for installation of carp deterrents and barriers on the Tennessee River. And that environmental assessment needed to account for input from a stakeholder group that included multiple state and federal agencies all that have interest and authority on the river. Structured decision making was one tool that could be utilized to solicit input from the stakeholder group and then come to a group consensus on the best locations for carp deterrence. So in 2020, the USGS facilitated a structured decision making workshop to inform TVA's environmental assessment. The overall concept with SDM, and Dave just covered this in a lot more detail than I will, is to use a process that has participation from a stakeholder group to develop a unified strategy. In this case, that unified voice was intended to provide a consensus set of recommendations on where and what type of carp barriers should be prioritized. And the SDM process overall works by breaking down a complex decision into its component parts, subjecting those parts to analysis, and then reassembling the parts into a final decision. So on this slide, that's just the stepwise process that Dave covered and on the following slides, I'll talk about some of those parts individually for this project. So due to agency requirements with COVID, all SDM workshops were held virtually. And surprisingly, I think this actually seemed to work really well because we spread them out over multiple weeks using shorter sessions. And that's instead of just cramming everything into a few days with really long days. But the overall process did take about three months to complete. In this case, the problem was also relatively straightforward. The purpose of the SDM was to have the stakeholders, again, that's all state and federal agencies with interest and authority on the river, to reach a consensus decision on where and what type of barriers could best stop carp invasion. That problem did become a little more complex when we tried to decide if efforts should be focused on cutting off movements directly at the leading edge where they're already established or focusing upstream on the uninvaded lakes. And the stakeholder group, which is listed on the right here, includes representatives from both the federal side, that's TVA, the Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, and also USGS with Max and Dave again being the independent observers, uh, but also state resource management agencies from Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, and Mississippi. 
So the stakeholder group first developed a set of management objectives. These included minimizing carp abundance and distribution, maximizing public satisfaction, minimizing impacts to lock operation, uh, and minimizing impacts to native species, and minimizing costs. And for this presentation, I'll mainly focus on minimizing carp abundance. But we do have a final report that's publicly available, and I'll show the citation for that at the end of this presentation if you're interested. All right, so control actions considered by the group were to use harvest and removal. That's essentially an attempt to overexploit carp populations, along with non physical deterrence. So, those are technologies that could mitigate the risk of upstream fish movement without physically impeding the waterway. And again, that's important to promote the interests of recreational and commercial navigation. Permanent lock closure it likely would be effective, but it wasn't considered for this process because the Corps of Engineers is congressionally mandated to operate the locks to support navigation. So that reduced the possible deterrence that were considered by the group to underwater acoustic deterrent systems. That's essentially underwater sound. Uh, the bioacoustic fish fence, that's a multi-sensory approach that's actually in place on the Cumberland River at Barkley Lock right now. Carbon dioxide, it's a registered pesticide. It's a chemosensory deterrent to reduce fish movements. Electricity, we're familiar with, to mobilize fish. We also did consider the no barrier deterrent option. Deterrents themselves did present a challenge to the group just because there's very little field data available for the effectiveness estimates. Our sick particularly because there aren't any current installations on the Tennessee River itself. So that resulted in a need for expert judgment, which was really a review of past studies at other locations at various scales. And the implementation of the actions were also considered to be dynamic with actions occurring over time. So for example, barriers could be installed and maintained indefinitely, or they could be removed at some point in the future. And similarly, targeted removal could occur in one year, sorry about that, um, but not in the next in response to changing carp density. And those changes with actions in response to changing conditions really is the basis for adaptive management. All right, so for the purposes of comparing the control options, we developed a model to simulate carp population dynamics on the Tennessee River and by we and Max and Dave. The management actions of barrier placement at locks and dams and targeted removal through harvest are designed to impede the upstream carp distribution. We assume that abundance, which is N in this equation, in any reservoir was determined by reproduction and survival within the reservoir, as well as emigration and immigration to other reservoirs. And, uh, we assume that barriers would affect the emigration process and that targeted removal would affect the survival process. And because the carp invasion on the Tennessee River was relatively new and uh, not really widespread throughout the system, we didn't have much data to describe the underlying population dynamics. Uh, so we took a broader approach and just assumed four different population models that could potentially describe the probability of carp establishing populations in other reservoirs. So essentially each model reflected different speeds of invasion. All right, so here's an initial draft of the model in the form of an Excel spreadsheet. The spreadsheet was provided to the workshop participants and that allowed them to create their own various management strategies and scenarios uh, and to evaluate its effect on carp distribution and relative abundance. So participants could try scenarios and different assumptions such as barrier effectiveness, movement rate, recruitment frequency, fishing mortality, and also variation in population growth rates. The spreadsheet projected carp distribution and relative abundance over 20 years within the Tennessee River. Max and Dave did emphasize with these tools that they weren't necessarily for forecasting, but rather just to help evaluate the relative com consequences of different assumptions. The one challenge we ran into is that the stakeholders were somewhat uncertain with the estimates of barrier effectiveness, mostly due to limited field data when this process occurred. So we simplified that problem uh, to focus on placement of hypothetical barriers uh, and then op optimizing the placement of those hypothetical barriers. So for this analysis, we assume that you can install one barrier per year, and this could be done along with targeted removal. And we, 
we then let the effectiveness of each barrier vary from 50% effective all the way up to 100% effective. So in other words, 50% uh, of the individuals who tried to make migrate upstream were unsuccessful, uh, all the way up to 100% were unsuccessful. And we assume that we're trying to minimize the abundance of individuals above Pickwick Lake after 20 years. All right, so these plots are some examples of the output showing the sequence of decisions where year is on the x-axis and represents that 20-year projection. Uh, basically, this shows that the most promising barrier placement was further downstream and that targeted removal should be focused on those reservoirs that are near the leading edge of invasion. Uh, however, as barrier effectiveness increased, which you see the 100% on the lower the need for more barriers declined and suggested that simply arresting the flow of carp with a barrier, along with targeted removal at the leading edge, was enough to stop invasion. So the one important component of this SDM process was to demonstrate the application of barriers and targeted removal was better than doing nothing. So in other words, was spending the resources and effort to stop carp worthwhile? And this Figure is just one example of that comparison to show how well each strategy performed relative to the, the do nothing option. And not surprisingly, as barrier effectiveness increased, the proportion of the population that was able to spread decreased. All right, so to generalize findings, all analyses supported restricting CARP near the leading edge with some upstream placement. Not surprisingly, Increasing effectiveness of a barrier reduced the need for redundant or additional barriers to be placed, allowed those barriers to be placed closer to the downstream leading edge. Uh, and maybe most importantly, the results suggested that a combination of targeted removal along with barrier placement was needed. Barriers and targeted removal used individually were expected to be less effective. All right, to wrap things up, I overall, I thought this project was a nice example of how SDM could be useful to inform management decision. And this process uh, worked I guess, due to the high level of participation and engagement from the stakeholder group. Uh, this process took three months and we had weekly participation from at least one representative from each agency. Uh, and ultimately, stakeholders did arrive at a consensus set of recommendations on where and what type of deterrent should be placed. That information was turned over to TVA in the form of a unified letter uh, and directly incorporated into the environmental assessment before it was finalized for public comment. Additionally, the rapid turnaround of information from the process met all the deadlines in the environmental assessment process. Max, shout out to him. He did a great job turning around the publication, the final report. I did take a screenshot of the title page. It's on this slide. If you're interested, it can be downloaded, it is publicly available. And with that, I will take any questions. Feel free to reach out to any of the contacts listed here if you'd like more information. Again, I appreciate the invite to present and thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Aaron. That's right on time. Do we have any questions? It looks like in the question and answer, we do have several citations that were dropped in for decision-making processes. So those of you who are interested, please check those out in the question and answer box. I do see one question now in the question and answer box, Aaron, which you might uh, try to address that. Maurice Sadowski asks, if there was a digestive, so reasonably selective carp birth control method how would reduced recruitment affect the model? Maybe take some, take a stab at answering that in the question and answer box. That might be a little bit outside the scope of what you were talking about here. You were talking about uh, deterrence and barriers. So that may be a more appropriate question for someone else to answer. Sure, no, but uh, population growth was considered those stock recruitment models. Um, I think, the benefit of taking that broad approach, developing four different population models where um, low growth to all the way up to really high growth, hopefully it encompasses some of those possible scenarios. Um, but if there are specifics and especially field data that could inform those, I think uh, Dave would probably agree that that would really help to refine your ground truth, some of those estimates. Thanks, Aaron. 
I see no other questions in the question and answer box, and I don't see anything in the chat box either. I guess we'll transition just a couple of minutes early into our next presentation. And this is our last one, last planned presentation for the day. And Adam Sepulveda from our Northern Rockies Research Station will now talk about another specific example of decision making. And this one's a little broader with a little different flavor to it about uh, tricented muscles, which are a problem in some places and not yet present in others. And I think Adam's going to focus on that prior question. And Adam, I see your slides. Looks like they're ready to go. The floor is yours. Thanks, Patrick. Um, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I just want to acknowledge Dave Smith as a, a co-author and, and a mentor on this project. Um, he definitely um, led the way with, with showing myself and the other stakeholders and decision makers of, of how to efficiently go through the structured decision making process. This was my first um, opportunity to interact in an SDM process. So I'm, I, I initially started to tackle this question from the perspective of environmental DNA sampling for aquatic invasive species, where there is a general issue in the eDNA community and the aquatic invasive species community of how do you appropriately respond after an environmental DNA detection. There seems to be a lot of um, confusion, frustration, and just uh, um, uncertainty with what do you do after you get an eDNA detection of an invasive species. So that's what I'll be talking about primarily in this talk. Try to advance my slide. Here we go. Our collaborators consisted of a handful of different decision makers and stakeholders on this project, as well as technical experts from the USGS. So there's a, a big team that participated in this virtual workshop that occurred last year. So the outline, I'll first give a little bit of background about environmental DNA and why there's so much uncertainty. I'll then focus in on a dry suited muscle, a quagga zebra muscle case study, and then go through our decision model. And I think one of the things I wanna underscore here at the very beginning is that we did a decision uh, activity on one reservoir on one issue. Um, so this is very much a case study and our results are not generalizable to other systems. So first off, I'll talk a bit about eDNA sampling in the invasion process. Uh, environmental DNA sampling, um, or environmental DNA in general, is a, a activity where we try to sample the DNA produced by organisms, in this case, fish is shown in this picture, they produce or slough off extracellular DNA. That DNA gets into the water, which is our environment. And as it's floating or suspended in the water, we can easily capture it with water samples. We then take those water samples, we uh, centrifuge or filter them down, and then we then use a molecular workflow to look for the DNA of our target organisms, our target communities. So that's the environmental sampling process. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty in this process. It's a very sensitive and powerful method for detecting the DNA of real organisms, but it's also imperfect. It's important for everyone to understand that eDNA sampling only detects DNA, and we have to use those patterns or those trends in our DNA detections to infer species presence. I mean, just to kind of walk you through what this actually means. So if we have a water sample where we collect DNA. Uh, it's possible for that DNA to come from a living fish, potentially a dead fish, or potentially from some outside or upstream source. Here, that would be called a lachrymous material. Um, when we get that DNA into our sample, we don't really know which one of these three different pathways caused that uh, DNA detection. So there's a lot of uncertainty then on what a D DNA detection actually means. Is it from a living present fish? Is it from something that is dead and no longer viable, therefore not possible of uh, causing an invasion or infestation, or is it potentially just DNA residue? So that's where we get that uncertainty. And then we also know from Invasive Species Biology 101 that uh, successful invasions are very hard to predict. Uh, invasions go through a bunch of different filters, starting with uh, introductions and then uh, finalizing with successful establishment, reproduction, and spread. 
There's many things and many different types of filters that could cause these uh, introductions to fail, whether that's immediately or if that's a couple of years down the road. So the actual invasion outcome is very uncertain. We know this from examples that many of us on this phone call have participated in and a bunch of literature that most invasions are thought to fail. Many go through these boom bust invasions, yet still others are sleeper invasions where the invader uh, occurs at very low undetectable densities and then pops up 10 years later and becomes a huge problem. Um, so invasion success, just like EDNA detections, have a lot of uncertainty in, in our ability to, to uh, forecast or portend the future. So we're often challenged with this decision problem with EDNA where we have a detection. We can uh, choose between two alternatives, in this case here, some type of action or no action. And with each of those uh, alternatives, we can get different outcomes. From a no action, we could have no infestation because uh, maybe uh, there was a boom and a bust or it was a dead uh, organism, or we could have a, 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 a negative, negatively impacted infestation. If we do decide to act following those EDNA detections, we could also have no infestation because that action was successful. Um, we could stop or minimize the impact of infestation or our action may not be effective. We may have infestation regardless. Um, and so this is why we've kind of turned to this structured decision-making problem uh, or this tool set. It allows us to look at these different alternatives uh, to align them with the the values of the decision makers and the stakeholders and to then integrate them with different likelihoods or statistical probabilities of how likely we are to get our desired outcome that matches or aligns with our values. Um, and it's, yeah, tons of uncertainty. And so we don't really have a good way of knowing with 100% certainty what is going to happen. So we, we need some tools. We think that structured decision making is potentially a very useful tool set to try to wade our way through this uncertain, unknown, and difficult process. So I'll turn now and talk about the case study we worked on since Dave and others have provided an overview of decision science and structured decision making. We focus in on Jordan L Reservoir, which is just outside of Salt Lake City. Um, for those that don't know Salt Lake City, Critical things here to recognize is that there's now a population of over a million people in that Wasatch Range area around Salt Lake City. There's a huge water demand, and this or Jordanelle Reservoir is where a lot of the water comes from to feed that Salt Lake City region area. On the reservoir, there is a dam that also provides hydropower. It's a very large reservoir, like many others in the West, so any action you take is going to be very difficult to do. Uh, because of the size of the reservoir and depth, and it's also going to be very costly. And uh, you're also going to uh, potentially upset a lot of uh, important constituents, the general public here, uh, because this reservoir, again, is where people get their water, and it's also where most people recreate. I think in 2020, uh, over a million people use that reservoir for uh, swimming, boating, fishing, camping, etc. So this is a very classic problem for uh, aquatic invasive species where any potential action you take is going to upset someone. There's going to be large potential costs. And so we have to figure out how to, uh, how to potentially balance off the trade-offs of any decision. So the decision model I'll present today um, is one that just was published actually this morning. It came out in kind of an early online access in the journal Management of Biological Invasions. So we worked with a handful of different decision makers and stakeholders that are charged with um, management of Jordan L Reservoir in Utah. This included U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, who uh, oversees the dam, Central Utah Water Conserv Conservancy District, who oversees the water storage, delivery, and higher hydropower production from the dam, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, who oversees the management of the fishery, um, and also the aquatic invaders, and then Utah Division of Parks and Recreation, who oversees the state park that Jordan L Reservoir is located on. So this was uh, the working, these are the, uh, the agencies uh, represented by the, the people in our working group. We worked with these decision makers and stakeholders to, to frame the problem. Here, the problem statement was, 
what are the appropriate actions to take following more than one eDNA detection within a season of quagga zebra mussel eDNA at Jordanelle? And we wanted to know what is the appropriate action uh, immediately, so within a few weeks following those multiple detections, and also over time, so up to eight years following those eDNA detections. So we looked at both immediate and long-term consequences from our actions. We worked with the, uh, this uh, group to identify the values and objectives. Uh, they arrived at five different objectives with a couple of different attributes for each objective. They wanted to protect the water supply since uh, over 1 million people rely, rely on it in the Salt Lake City area. They wanted to protect the ecosystem, which both meant minimizing the extent of infestation within the reservoir, but also minimizing the spread to other water bodies in the region. They wanted to make recreational access by the public. Here that meant minimizing your number of uh, boat ramp closures. They wanted to maintain public support for the state aquatic invasive species program. Uh, so that was uh, uh, it's measured by the level of support. And finally, they wanted to minimize the financial costs where costs were derived from anything that you had to do to the dam or water delivery network to retrofit the, the infrastructure. And then any potential costs involved with uh, uh, control, containment, or managing uh, the, the potential infestation of zebra quagga mussels. And then finally, we asked the decision makers and stakeholders to weight the importance of these different objectives. Key thing here is to recognize that uh, the objective that they wanted, that they ranked the highest or the most important was maintaining public support. On a scale of zero to 10, they gave that a 10. And then second, they found that uh, minimizing spread to other water bodies was an eight. All of the other objectives were much less important with the next highest one being a four. So that's important to recognize because uh, those values definitely drive many of the, the, uh, the results from our modeling effort. So we worked with the, uh, the working group to identify a couple of different alternatives at our different decision time points. So we started here on the left side of the figure, just DP1, decision point one, and that's after you get multiple eDNA detections. Managers could decide to do one of three things. First, they could attempt to confirm it using non-eDNA tools, in this case, things like plankton toe nets or scuba. Um, and if they were to confirm, confirm it with the plankton toe nets, they were to capture uh, muscle larvae called villagers or maybe sea adults, they would then go on to different decisions. Um, so they could, if they found it, they would go to a different decision tree or if they or if they failed to find it, they would go to a different decision tree. So I'm going to step through this de decision tree with a couple of examples here. So again, the first thing they could do, the first alternative was to attempt to confirm it with non-eDNA. They could also immediately try to contain it to minimize the potential that mussels could spread to other water bodies. And here, what that meant is establishing a watercraft inspection stations that all boats would have to go through upon exit of Jordanelle Reservoir. Third, they can try to do a combination of a con containment and control action where they contain using the watercraft inspection stations and then they control the local mussel infestation using something like a, a mussel poison. After about four weeks, if, you, uh, if the managers were to attempt to confirm it using things like plankton toe nets, they would be faced with a second decision. Uh, again, if, uh, if they failed to find it, managers can then do no response. They can do containment or they can do contaminant control. Or if they did actually find evidence of muscles, they can do the same thing. No response, containment, or containment and control. And so the way that we worked with the managers and the, uh, the technical experts to evaluate the consequences of the different decisions is we first, uh, our, our metric we're really trying to hit here was what is the probability that infestation occurs given the different pathways along this decision tree? Um, what was the likelihood that it would occur in one year or up to eight years? And then because we had a lot of uncertainty about the dynamics of the muscle invasion, we looked at two different models or uh, population dynamics. The first is rapid spread, where if mussels were to invade, they would thrive and spread very quickly within the reservoir. 
The second was a rules of 10, where if muscles were to be introduced, they were very likely to fail. So we kind of used uh, two different extreme models to look at the population dynamics. And then finally, we looked at the sensitivity analysis because we knew we do not have perfect information. So we were trying to find a, an alternative that was robust across many elements of uncertainty. So we inputted different parameters to represent worst case, median case, and best case. And we're hoping to find a decision or an alternative that provided uh, the best decision across these, these three different uh, uh, parameter inputs of best, median, or worst case. So our results if, uh, here on the x-axis is cumulative performance. So this is what the expected outcome is across multiple years, given all those different objectives that we identified uh, based on the alternative, which is shown on the y-axis. Uh, each bar here shows uh, the outcome you would expect to get using your best case, which tends to be on the far right of the bar, your median case, which is a gap in that bar, and your worst case, which tends to be on the left side. And so what we find is that uh, delayed containment is the optimal decision under that rules of 10 uh, population dynamic model, which is where most invasions fail, but also under the rapid spread. Why? We get our highest cumulative performance when we have the best case happen. We have the highest cumulative performance when we have the typical or median case happen. And we have uh, the least worst outcome under our worst case scenario. And that again is uh, concurrent with rules of 10 and rapid spread model. So what this means from a manager for Jordanelle Reservoir is that when, if, if and when you get multiple eDNA detections, you should go out and attempt to confirm it using non-eDNA methods after approximately four weeks, regardless of whether you find muscles or not, you should then go on and put in containment measures. So those watercraft inspection stations. Why was this the optimal decision, which we're calling delayed containment? Again, it goes back to those objectives uh, and their importance weights. Uh, managers really thought it was critical to maximize public support of the program. And uh, if you were to delay contain containment and go out and try to look for the muscles, that really tended to maximize public support, especially if you were to find the muscles. And it also minimized spread to other waters, which was the second highest ranked objective by putting in those containment stations. Um, and we also found that there was nothing to lose by waiting approximately four weeks. That did not uh, change the public support of the program. If nothing else, it actually increased it by, by showing you had a commitment to monitoring. And also it did not increase the likelihood of spread to other water bodies, water bodies if you only waited four weeks. So it's what they call in poker, a, a free roll. Um, only upsides and minimal downsides. So that's uh, the brief case study I wanted to present. Just to let you know, we're now working with uh, the state of Maine to test a similar framework that we used at Jordanelle on Sebago Lake um, to see how generalizable this framework is and if, if managers at Sebago Lake actually come to a similar conclusion, given that they may have different objectives. So thank you so much. Great, Adam. Thanks very much for a strong finish to our symposium this morning or this afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. I want to thank all of the uh, U.S. Geological Survey authors, presenters today who shared their work with us. And a big thanks again to Elizabeth and her team for working with us on another successful National Invasive Species Awareness Week symposium. The number of participants never dropped before, <clears throat> below about the 150s. So that speaks to the reach that you have and potentially the draw of USGS research, which we aim to please. So at this point, I will open it up for general questions on any of the subjects we had today. Please feel free to use the question and answer box or to use the hand raise feature. Patrick, I'd be happy to send my PowerPoint to you for distribution or in whatever way you want me to do that. That'd be fantastic. Thanks, Dave. So we tried to answer all the questions in the chat. I think we got all of them, but um, hopefully people saw that. Looks like we have one more question in the question and answer box, this time directed at uh, 
uh, Richie Erickson from Hamori Sadowski. So if you had the piscicide that targeted carp, it would be, the impact would be that you would decrease recruitment because you decrease the number of recruiting individuals. So the model would probably give a linear response, but there's also a chance that if you didn't kill enough of the carp, this, so this is why we're doing the spawning stock biomass research, because if we kill some of the carp, there's a good chance we'll just release density dependence and actually make more, we'll make healthier carp. With the Illinois River, they found this where there's some harvest, it increases the condition of the fish. So you get healthier fish. So it's, but with the model, just be a linear decrease. As you kill more carp, there's fewer recruitment. But the actual biology of the system is that you have to kill enough fish to overcome the release from density is what we speculate. I hope that helps answer your question. Thanks very much, Richie. So I, uh, Caleb Aldridge has asked a question of uh, Dave, Aaron, and Adam. What is the biggest challenge or biggest challenges you have faced as an SDM facilitator? I can try it, Patrick, because I'm just going through the process now, again, with the, the Sebago Lake. My experience has been limited to the virtual environment, uh, which obviously provides a lot of, of challenges. Um, but the biggest challenge so far has really uh, been getting all the pertinent decision makers and stakeholders to the table. Um, oftentimes, it's been challenging to, to get the the actual decision maker versus just a proxy for that decision maker. Uh, because the people that are actually tasked with these decisions are incredibly busy and, and uh, don't have adequate time to, to dedicate uh, to at least the virtual workshop. So for an example, we're meeting two hours once a week for about uh, six, six weeks. Um, and that was similar to what we did for our Jordan L Reservoir case study, it was about an hour and a half to two hour meeting weekly for uh, about a month or two. And uh, yeah, again, the people, the managers tasked with the decision-making are so darn busy. It's really hard to get them to, uh, to, to commit to that, that uh, consistent time spread out across a bunch of weeks. But their, their input is critical. It's what makes the, the structured decision-making process work. Great, thanks, Adam, Aaron, and Dave. Anything additional to add to that? Yeah, I would just maybe to add on to that, we did have kind of the opposite response for the virtual workshops. I thought we were able to, on Tennessee River, uh, have great participation from the entire stakeholder group, and they participated throughout the whole thing. And that's really what, what made it work, because that engagement was needed. And we didn't encounter it, but I think that would probably be the biggest challenge is if you don't have full participation, the, the outcomes... Uh, really, they may not be as useful as they need to be. I just throw in uh, a comment that uh, the difference between the invasive carp uh, application uh, case study and the eDNA case study was that there, there was a distinct decision to be made by the invasive carp folks, um, invasive carp folks because of a decision timeline. Um, and so that, I think that uh, created a lot of motivation for participation, which was extremely helpful, as Aaron mentioned. And I'll just throw in that each problem has its own kind of challenge, and you will encounter challenges in terms of what the objectives are, complexity in the alternatives, challenges with the face because of uncertainty. But a pretty common difficulty or challenge is that folks often think that the impediment to making a decision is that the science isn't there, that the science is uncertainty, is uncertain, but it's often the value conflict that is the impediment to decision making in these kind of collaborative environments. Great, thank you, Dave, Adam, and Aaron. I don't see any additional questions in the question and answer box right now. So I think, um, Elizabeth, why don't we conclude this? Would you like to uh, come back and give us any uh, concluding thoughts? Uh, 
Okay, there we go. I'm off mute. This was outstanding as expected. So thank you to all of our speakers and to everybody that joined in. At one point, we exceeded 200 people, which is outstanding for this first event during National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, I learned a lot today, and I hope that you all did too. Um, please take a look. I'll throw it in the chat here at nisa.org and look at all the different events we have this week um, and get registered for any of those that may be helpful to you. Uh, take advantage of the free toolkit that is posted at nisa.org and please take a look at our brand new policy pages that our subcommittees work so hard for. So, um, if you are not a NASMA member, I invite you to please check out the options for membership and partnership at our website, nasma.org. We can't do what we do without your support and this support and expertise like you had on this webinar today with all of these fantastic USGS folks. So thanks to everybody here. Have a great National Invasive Species Awareness Week, and I hope to see you all on future webinars. Um, and with that, thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. And Patrick, thank you so much. I really appreciate your partnership. Yeah, we appreciate it as well. Thank you so much for working with us, and I look forward to next year. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.